Beginning in 1947, delegates from six continents devoted themselves to drafting a declaration that would enshrine the fundamental rights and freedoms of people everywhere. It proclaims a simple, powerful idea. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Now there is still, as you all know, much more to be done to secure that commitment, that reality and progress for all people. Today I want to talk about the work we have left to do to protect one group of people whose human rights are still denied in too many parts of the world today. In many ways, they are an invisible minority. They are arrested, beaten, terrorized, even executed. They are denied opportunities to work and learn, driven from their homes and countries, and forced to suppress or deny who they are. I am talking about gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. The victims are calling it a brutal hate crime, and they believe they were attacked because they're gay. Two were rushed to the hospital with severe injuries, including one with a fractured face. They just didn't like who we were. One victim has a badly bruised face. The other had to have his jaw wired shut after oral surgery. Attacked seemingly because they're gay. Do you think gay people should be executed? The Bible says that, so yeah. She says that she was disgusted when she found out that her 16-year-old daughter was claiming to be bisexual. It's a disturbing video of a gay man being beaten in queen. A victim say that he lives his life as an openly gay man. Police believe it was his sexual orientation that nearly got him killed. Hi, my name's Matt. I'm 24 years old and I'm gay. For the last five months, I, along with the rest of the EGAL team, have been working on Courage in the Face of Hate. Ryan, Dr. Barb Perry, and I, we traveled across Canada to interview victims of bullying and hate crime in the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans community. We need to talk about it. We need to hear their voices. So, here are their voices. Uh, bias-motivated crime is uh, violence against LGBTQ uh, community members is how big a problem it, it feels to be uh, from your perspectives. We need to take into account that we've lost 300 lives. What has the world missed? A lot of the bullying and the harassment and the discrimination um, and the violence comes from pressure within everyone to conform to certain norms. You know, you do those standard testing and apparently I scored really well, so that was the intention of the teacher bringing my mother in. But So she tells my mother this and then is like, well, the, you know, the real important issue is I feel like um, your daughter's a tomboy and that they may grow up to, to be gay and queer. When I was in public school, I knew there was something different about me, but it wasn't something that was discussed because I was born in a rural farm area and wasn't some, you know, I just knew that I liked the girls and mm -hmm. there was something different about me. I pretty much knew that I was always gay, you know. I had that feeling ever since I was younger, but I mean, it was sort of hard to identify at that age. Um, it wasn't really that mass as it is now. Early high school came out to myself in Thunder Bay. It wasn't until probably grade 11 and 12 
that I started you know, getting taller and more masculine. This was the big thing that started to happen was I was a tomboy, I only had two older brothers. Uh, so it was always, I didn't understand why I couldn't be like one of the guys, you know, why I couldn't, and I used to cry when I was a kid because, you know, the boys didn't, like, they could have a bottle in the car when we'd go camp and they could pee in a bottle and I couldn't, like, just silly things like that, but, you know, mom said ever since I was a young age was this, I, I you know, I identified more with guys and wanted to be closer to that. And when I got into high school, I started to walk the halls and realized how different I was with my short hair and my t-shirts and jeans when... The other girls were all pretty and fluffy little sweaters and and uh, that's when I realized I was different. I just felt like I couldn't be what everybody else wanted to, me to be and I already had issues with that like through school and wanting to be smarter and wanting to be a better athlete or wanting to be a better musician and different things like that. In high school that began my nightmare of bullying from age 11 and the bullying and the name calling because I was seen to be sissish or effeminate. It's lasted all throughout my life. And so therefore, because I know the pain that, it is, that it happens with this, and because I know the many times I've had to receive tr psychiatric treatment because I was severely depressed. My mom gave me the option to either end my relationship with my girlfriend or to move out. So I chose to move out of the house at 16 years old. Yeah. I don't know how a parent can just stop loving their children. I don't, that, I can't fathom that. Um, or not have them be with them anymore. He says he, he, he was, uh, uh, <clears throat> He was let go, but under false pretenses. They argue that, c'est plus facile pour moi si je vous interroge, je suis vraiment désolé là, mais si je vous laisse parler trop longtemps, je vais refaire le moment. Puis c'est tellement intéressant que je veux rien manquer. So since he was taking hormones, they were telling him that he was not himself anymore. So est-ce que je 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 devine là-dedans qu'on a mis ça sur le dos d'un problème de santé mentale? Tout à fait. So they blame, they said that he was mentally ill. I'm appalled. No kidding. I mean, I'm and quite, and quite literally, they said this outright, not just. Est-ce que vous implying? avez dit ça directement? Presque. Okay. Presque. Vous souvenez-vous un peu de la formulation? Pas eu tellement. Ah bon? Ça a duré deux ans le harcèlement. Uh, he said that her, he was harassed for two years before he resigned because I guess he couldn't take it. Out. I've been living alone since I was 15 because at, fi at 15 I told my mom I was gay and she kicked me out so I've been having to work three jobs uh, ever since to support myself. Um, I've lived in the streets in Windsor for about a year living on streets behind garbage ways and alleyways. Name it, I probably slept there. Size I was 12 to today I live by myself. I grew up by myself. My mother was the street. My father was I guess the drugs. I survived. I survived. It's a lot unsafe on the street, yes, it's true. I live for over 11 years on the street, as a street, as a sex worker, and I was addicted to crack cocaine. And um, I don't know how I survived, so how my mind decided um, that was to today, 10 years ago in November. I don't know what the numbers are here in Regina. Our weather's too cold to have a lot of homelessness and kids living on the street. Um, but certainly I bet you there's a lot of couch surfers, um, kids that are trying to find a place to belong. So when I told my mom about this, like my struggles with coming out and everything, she wanted me to seek help from my family doctor to give me resources in Kingston. When I went to my family doctor, I just kind of told him I was gay to start it off with. And then his response was pretty much that I was going to hell because he was a Christian. If my own parents can't accept me, then why should I even bother trying to accept myself? Every day it was, I mean, I remember getting out of the hospital and I was in the garage and I there was a, a couple chains in there and I had a loose around that and I, I thought, well, this is how I'll do it. So I, I tied a loose around my neck and I tried to hang myself, but Every day it was a struggle just to stay alive. And uh, I started to praying to God every night before I went to bed. I just started asking for 
the strength to carry on because I couldn't do it alone. I'm from the Caribbean. Being a lesbian or being gay or being whatever, you're discriminated against. And I got first hand of it. I was beaten, I was kicked out. At 18, I was homeless. I went to go into the washroom and when I was in there, I was in a stall. But I guess some guy came in by accident and was like, oh, sorry, man. And because I guess, like, I know, I know I locked it, but I guess, like, it got jimmied open or something. It was really bizarre. But he double took, and then he looked at me oddly, and then he walked away, and then suddenly he came back with a, a bunch of guys, and they just, like, one of them hit me and kind of blindsided me. And then I remember being conscious and then being full of urine. I, I guess I had this, like, paranoia, too, of, like, what, what, how could I get out of here? without this happening or without somebody saying something or whatever. Um, and so I basically just uh, got my, my, my bag and all my shit and I just ran um, to Dan's office, the professor. Um, and I was so lucky that he was there. Um, and I was just, I was shaking. I, I couldn't, I couldn't even articulate what just happened. I am devastated over the death of 18-year-old Tyler Clementi. If you don't know, Tyler was a bright student at Rutgers University whose life was senselessly cut short. He was outed as being gay on the internet and he killed himself. Something must be done. This month alone, there have been a shocking number of news stories about teens who have been teased and bullied and then committed suicide, like 13-year-old Seth Walsh in Tehachapi, California. This needs to be a wake-up call to everyone that teenage bullying and teasing is an epidemic in this country and the death rate is climbing. One life lost in this senseless way is tragic. Four lives lost is a crisis. And these are just the stories we hear about. How many other teens have we lost? How many others are suffering in silence? Being a teenager and figuring out who you are is hard enough without someone attacking you. My heart is breaking for their families for their friends and for our society that continues to let this happen. These kids needed us and we have an obligation to change this. There are messages everywhere that validate this kind of bullying and taunting and we have to make it stop. We can't let intolerance and ignorance take another kid's life. And I want anyone out there who feels different and alone to know that I know how you feel. They were going to church and my grandpa had said to me, I think you should just sit this one out, Rachel, and maybe you shouldn't come anymore. And it was just kind of like a big kick in the face because it was like, that's how we view you. And it's like, you know what? That kind of is okay because it's like, I used to get a lot of pressure to be baptized and be a Jehovah's Witness. And like every time I saw my grandparents, they'd be like, so when do you plan on getting baptized, Rachel? When is this happening, Rachel? It's like, it's never happening. I'm gay, but I could never say it because I'd be sent out on the curb right away and have to sleep in under a bush or something. My religious experiences haven't been good, but I do celebrate progressive pockets of religion in people. It's in the actions of the people who are inclusive and progressive that at least are a bit of a bright light in that to see forward. And so for me, there was a, there was a heavy religious aspect of I was told this is, this is not right. You know, who you are isn't, isn't the way you're supposed to be. So when I was probably about 15 and had been trying so hard to, to be who I was supposed to be, um, and I just couldn't do it. So I got to a point where I, I sort of I stayed up all night thinking about what to do. Um, and I got to a point where I thought, you know what, I, I can't be this. It's not working. Um, so it's time for me to just try it my way. Um, when I came to university, there were a, that's when I kind of got exposed to religion and some differing opinions people had about gay people uh, and religion, but I kind of think, uh, I think religion is mostly, from what I understand, <laughs> about kind of loving and accepting people, so that's, there's a lot of religious folk out there that do that, and I support them. And just one day, I guess this, just this, amazing, I just felt this amazing strength within me and I, I truly believe that it's, it's, there's a higher power out there of some sort. I don't know what it is, but it just, it gave me the strength that I needed to go on. I spend my time just trying to be myself 
and yes, I am gay, but it's not necessarily, you know, I don't go around and say, hey, I'm Chinese. <laughs> it's, that's who I am, and that's what I am. It's, it's more about how I run my life and how I want to make an impact in this world as opposed to, you know, how I'm going to live my life under a title. Realizing that, that traditional basis and the more I've been sort of digging around is that, you know, some First Nations groups did have, you know, words for two-spirited. Uh, some did not because they didn't feel there was a need to create a word. It was just the way you were, you know. So realizing that, you know, my own culture before colonization had this openness and it wasn't even about needing to pick a certain sexual preference. Like it became about the roles that you would play within the community. You know, we played big roles in teaching children because we could assume both male and female roles and so we were trained that way so they said that, you know, traditionally they were identified sort of at a young age of having this uniqueness of both spirits. Well, I think the, you could like go both ways, like come up to someone and be like, so when did you decide to be straight? Kind of, like you know, like, people never think that they decided to be straight, but all of a sudden it's a choice to be gay, which is kind of stupid, but... I knew that I was different, that I was that there was something I had to hide, as, as I understood it, uh, since about four years old, probably. I guess I decided that it really sucked to date people that I didn't feel attracted to. I think I guess I decided that um, lying about who I was kind of sucked, so I guess I made those choices, but I don't think I decided to be gay. I don't think I ever decided to be gay. I think that what a lot of us have to decide is whether or not to really um, listen to ourselves or listen to what we think other people are telling us to do. Or My best friend is very homophobic, well, my best friend at the time, and um, I was terrified to tell her. And I didn't want to come out to a lot of people just because of like people's reactions and people like, I lost friends when I came out. and. That really sucks. Uh, I came up to my car, I was probably about 16, 17 years old, um, and somebody had taken a baseball bat and smashed it in my back window and spray painted faggot across the back of my car. Uh, and I was terrified because I didn't, I didn't even know what gay meant at that point. I didn't know what faggot meant. Um, and when I went to my, to my principal, he said, uh, maybe if you joined a sports team, that wouldn't happen to you. Um, I think one of the real problems with the safety, I don't know where it is safe in Toronto when I started my transition. Uh, people could easily identify that I was trans all the time and I faced constant harassment and people staring at me, giving me dirty looks, talking to each other and ridiculing and mocking me. Add that to the experiences of nearly being physically assaulted and my feeling was that I was never safe anywhere and that led to being very reclusive, isolating, which then tied in with severe depression and suicide attempts. So there's the practical issue of safety, but then there's the subjective experience of safety that is radically altered by those experiences we do have and whether or not they involve violence, even just harassment, bullying, ridiculing and mocking, that takes a tremendous toll on us. Based on somebody's sexual orientation, there shouldn't be any difference in the idea of what people perceive of love. Love is something that's supposed to be universal. It's supposed to be something that people can relate to on any level. And for somebody to say that somebody who loves a man who is a man is going to love somebody differently who's a woman, it just, it's never made sense to me. I'm very lucky. You know, I've never really confronted any hate crimes to my face. I might have gotten, you know, a faggot here and there, but it's rare. Um, but, you know, when I really think about it, I think more of it, more of the hate came from my family. It's something they can't understand. And I felt more of the hate came from them. And I was more afraid of them being, you know, hating me or not liking me. And, but in the end, I mean, they, they loved me and they, you know, it took, them t it took time to, to get over it. But a lot of that fear came from, you know, losing, losing something, which is like your family. And then it wasn't until after high school um, about a year, I went to Ghana, West Africa after high school, and then I went to university. And it was in university that I started being introduced to these different identities. Um, and then I realized that it was actually possible. Like it was actually like it was actually something to be born female and to feel like you're a guy. Like that was that was something that was, and not only that, but it was possible that you could. Um, put yourself in that identity and have the body that you felt more comfortable with. I live with Justin. This is this summer. He had been home for the summer and he was just around and he said, 
so you know I'm gay, right? And I was like, <laughs> and I cried. But I cried yeah. because I was so overjoyed because it was so great to see him like just he was obviously so happy and I just I don't know I he's never been happier One life lost in this senseless way is tragic. Four lives lost is a crisis. Being a teenager and figuring out who you are is hard enough without someone attacking you. Can't let intolerance and ignorance take another kid's life. It, it shows how thoughtless and how hurtful people can be. And it shows how much emotional damage can be done to a single human being over the internet. A freshman at Rutgers University. His name is Tyler Clementi. He jumped off the George Washington Bridge right into the Hudson River. Prosecutors say he did it after two of his classmates allegedly spied on him while he was having a sexual encounter. And then they showed it to the whole world. They put it on the internet, live in fact. They streamed it so everybody could see it. Any child is 13, 14 years old, it doesn't matter. You and you are trying to hide a fundamental part of yourself. What happens is that you, you, you cannot focus on anything else. Where are our heroes? You be that hero. We have to intervene. Schools have to start paying attention to anti-LGBT bullying now. I guess the big thing for me is about not being a bystander, that we all have a role that we can play. And when you see people around you who are being given a hard time to, to step in there, there's something you can say without it having to make a big deal. So it's important that we don't stay silent, that you know, when I was a kid, no one would speak up for me, and that led to a lot of hard times. So speak up for each other. I always say for the one getting bullied, there's 20 who are watching it happen. So don't watch it happen. Do something. You don't have to be queer to care about queers. Right? Everybody has to care about everybody. You know? We have to care about kids, families, the safety for everybody. So basically in life, when you're on your deathbed and thinking about everything that's happened to you, you're going to kind of think about what you've done to make you happy and what you've done for yourself. And if you've lived your life living the mold that everybody else wants you to be, what have you succeeded for yourself? There's a wide spectrum out there, and, and we just need to not be ignorant and educate ourselves and, and learn about what it means to be fully human and what it means to respect each other. All people deserve the right to love, to be loved. If we as human beings can take a look at our fellow human and say, yeah, I'm going to let you have every chance at your pursuit of happiness, and I hope you let me do the same. And it starts with accepting differences. My hope is that we've allowed our prejudices to fall by the wayside and we will allow ourselves to embrace the degree of intellect, the degree of caring, the degree of compassion that these 300 individuals who have taken their lives could have brought forth and we've let them down and we, we need to hell hold ourselves accountable for that my hope is that we we will live through a process that will embrace the skills the talents the intellect 
the respectability, the compassion, the passion that all of us have. And, and to understand that one's sexual orientation is such a minute part of that individual. I don't know if we're there yet. My hope is that we will be someday. We have a young generation coming up that is embracing, that's knowledgeable. Because for many young people, this is simple. All people deserve to be treated with dignity and have their human rights respected, no matter who they are or whom they love. Eleanor Roosevelt, who did so much to advance human rights worldwide, said that these rights begin in the small places close to home. The streets where people live, the schools they attend, the factories, farms, and offices where they work. These places are your domain. The actions you take, the ideals you advocate, can determine whether human rights flourish where you are. And finally, to LGBT men and women worldwide, let me say this. Please know that you are not alone. People around the globe are working hard to support you and to bring an end to the injustices and dangers you face.